Good afternoon, everyone. It's June the 4th, 2020. Welcome to the 12th edition of On the Menu. I'm Bob Patillo, your host today. We have with us all the way from Colorado, Mr. Don Van Winkle. Don, thank you for being here. Glad to be here, Bob. Thank you. Don, I'd like to start off with a little bit about you telling the listeners and the viewers a little bit about your history with Alamogordo. Got it. So uh, my parents are originally from the southeastern part of the state over in Portales. And in 1959, uh, they moved to Alamogordo. Dad was a butcher by training, a meat guy, had an opportunity here. So they moved. That didn't work out, but we landed in 1959. He ultimately went to work with the old Dills uh, Prime Meats and Groceries, which for some of the long-term people, they know that that was probably a grocery store and meat case that was way ahead of its time back in the early 60s. It really distinguished Alamogordo. And uh, I got started working for dad when I was eight years old, sacking groceries, and then behind that butcher counter. Uh, then later in the early 70s, he elected to leave Dills and go out on his own. And he and my mom, who is uh, Sue Watkins, who lives in uh, La Luce still, my dad passed away in 96, opened up the butcher shop and uh, got to go to work with dad. That was a real family business. Uh, I have three younger sisters. And uh, dad invested in it, had a couple of partners, and put together a meat processing plant that uh, did, uh, had a nice meat counter and uh, a full service of uh, uh, meat products for uh, all the Burger Time restaurants, the Sonics, and a lot of other places. And it was just such a great experience to work at my dad and mom's side when we were kids and watch them put together a business. And I, I remember realizing then it was uh, experiential learning. I saw dad, you know, pull in a hind quarter, cut it up, and make it something beautiful for the case and use every single piece, piece of the meat and make it work. And he, he just took a raw piece and made it beautiful and his butchers. And we watched that happen. And I look back fondly as do my sisters in terms of, uh, we just learned a lot working at their side. I uh, went to New Mexico State the first uh, year and a half up on the hill, still worked for my dad, uh, then went over to Las Cruces. Uh, well, let me back up. I was an Alamogordo Tiger, and I always tell the story that I was on the same football team with Randy Rabin and G.B. Oliver. I was on the team. They played. I think I was on the kickoff team. Uh, but that was, I just have a very fond heritage for the people. We were at Grace United Methodist Church, uh, lived over at Boyce. Uh, I went to uh, uh, high school in Alamogordo, but also grade school at Heights and then Chaparral and Mid-High. Went on to New Mexico State and I was prepared well. I had a great education in Alamogordo. I mean, I, was, I learned the basics and uh, ended up graduating from New Mexico State with a degree in finance and a minor in real estate. But while I was in college, Bob, I had a, a rare opportunity. I interviewed and was hired by the Treasury Department, which was the United States Comptroller of the Currency, to work in basically examining banks all over the Western United States. So here I was, a junior in college, spreading financial statements at the Valley National Bank of Arizona for a $50 million syndicated loan for Gulf uh, Learjet. And then I would go back into the classroom for six months. So I did that for two full years. And again, back to that theme of experiential learning, when you are working in the field and you see what it is to spread a financial statement and do analysis on a big credit, then you go back into the classroom, talk about high definition, technicolor learning, and it worked out. It took me two extra years to graduate. When I did, I went to work for the old First National Bank of Denver here in Colorado worked as a corporate banker for 11 years, then got the entrepreneurial urge and uh, went out and started doing contract chief financial officer work with a whole bunch of different clients. And, and I ended up sitting on boards and posturing those companies to be attractive to capital. This is back in the early 90s. And uh, then went to work as a full-time CFO for a sportswear design distribution company by the name of Fresh Produce Sportswear. A lot of women know it. It's a very hot line in the Caribbean, Florida, and California, Hawaii. My dad died in 96. By that time, he had evolved the butcher shop operation to six retail grocery stores. He was in business with uh, his brother. And uh, when he died, I came in and 
was the partner with his brother representing the interest of my sisters and I. So I, th I went through the family business piece in depth. I know it firsthand. We ended up buying my uncle out, Jim Van Winkle, and my sisters and I put the pieces in place and ran that for six years and sold it to the Lowe's organization in 2002. And uh, I moved back to Colorado in 2000 and traveled back and forth. And just, when I talk about beneficial scar tissue, it was huge. Uh, got back to Colorado, went to work for an investment banking firm, actually working with companies to sell those companies. And, you know, you work shoulder to shoulder, then you take them to market and you know that process, how to build value. And uh, that kept evolving. And today I do nothing but corporate development work, meaning I work shoulder to shoulder with owning com owners of companies to prepare them for creating future value, be it bank financing, a new board, a management team, uh, and just put all the financials together and then interface on their behalf when they want to acquire or if they want to be acquired or they want to raise capital or do financings. And Bob, it's probably the most uh, rewarding work I've ever done. And there seems to be a real demand for it out there. Thank you for that update. Now, Don, if I understand it right, are you on the bank board? I am. I'm on the bank board during my time at uh, in Alamogordo. I uh, was reacquainted with uh, Randy Rabin, and uh, Randy is the chairman of Bank 34. This is back in 2013. They reached out. They knew I had a banking background to include a bank regulatory background and asked me to come in and kind of work with them on a few fronts. And we got that done. And then they invited me to uh, sit on the board, which I've been on that board since 2013. And uh, a rewarding process in Bank 34 is an old line bank, very relationship oriented, which plays well for me. And our, if I remember right, your wife at one time was involved with the Chamber of Commerce when you lived here. Boy, she calls that just the grace of God. I mean, we moved down there. I was very heavily entrenched in uh, Van Winkle's IGA. And, uh, you know, the kids were up here, all of our contacts. And Toots Green met Colleen, knew she had a chamber background here in Boulder, and asked her to sit in an interim position when the chamber had then left for another job. And they ended up giving Colleen that job uh, full time for almost three years. And, uh, she did a great job. I'm biased, but I think she was very well received in the market and uh, it, was, it was a good process. Okay. Well, Don, thanks for the update. So everybody gets to know a little bit about you. And even though you live in Colorado, you still have a lot of family and business ties in the Alamogordo area. And we I appreciate do. that. You bet. You and I talked one time uh, about a concept called fix the gutter now. Can you uh, elaborate on that just a little bit? And then I believe we have some point by point details to go sure. over with that concept. Sure. So uh, when I was working shoulder to shoulder with uh, owner operators and preparing their companies to be attractive in a sales side presentation, uh, it occurred to me that Colleen and I were getting ready to sell our house. And, uh, you know, you do all the things, you replace the carpet, fix the front door, paint the trim, and I fixed the gutter that had come loose from the top of the, uh, the, the trim of the house. And uh, it looked beautiful. I remember Colleen saying, why didn't we do this five years ago? Why did we wait? And why did I let that gutter that had come loose just, I had a blind spot for it. So we got it fixed, it looked beautiful. We got it under contract at the full price. The home inspector came and said, wow, you had a gutter loose. Look at, did it go down and compromise your foundation? That could cost big bucks and you know compromise the closing. And I thought, you know, Don, how in the world did you let that blind spot get in your way and it might compromise the foundation? Well, it didn't, it all worked out okay. But the comparison is true for people within businesses. You need to fix the gutters now. Prepare yourself. Do all the refined levels now so you'll enjoy the business. And, and it drives good, healthy disciplines corporate-wise. Fix the things you need to fix. If you got a, you know, a, a financing relationship that's not good, fix that. If you've got contracts that are not in order, fix them. Uh, develop your people, have good tight financials. Because at the 11th hour, if your business is presented to an acquirer or a joint venture partner, you don't want to be scrambling trying to fix all those things because they ca could cause foundational problems. So I wrote an article on it and uh, it's been well received out there. It's just called Fix the Gutter Now. 
and I listed, I think, 10 things that I think you need, you know, 10 steps. There's a, a myriad of different things you can do, but those 10 were key to me and still are key. Don, let's talk about those 10. Uh, number one was talking about asking solid questions with uh, integrity, curiosity. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I think that was, uh, you know, just there were, the, there were the 10 initiatives around fixing, preparing your company and fix the gutter. Now, these are just observations from the trenches. And, and I deal, I've had a, a, a very varied background in a lot of different industry sectors. And I've been able to discern some patterns over time with successful people. And uh, I, I just, you asked me and I said, well, there's things that I find attractive, curiosity, integrity, listening and learning learning to ask good solid questions will put you in a place that very few people reside and if you mix in with that just personal grace intelligence and a tenacity you'll be unstoppable and i just see a lot of people owner operators who have lost their curiosity how to, about how to improve or develop people or move into a new product line and the really successful people still have that level of curiosity and they're always learning. They haven't just figured everything out. Does that answer your question, Bob, or any comments you might have on that? Well, that explains your, your take on curiosity. Let's talk about integrity a little bit and why that's important. You know, uh, a, a very strong mentor of me at one, for me at one time, Ray Kasaya. And uh, Ray, I'll remember, never forget, he told me, he said, Don, if you don't have integrity, you don't have a damn thing. And those of you who remember Ray Kasaya, you can hear him saying that. And uh, you either have integrity or you don't. It's not a lot of gray area in there. And you can just, people who with it have integrity, you can tell it by the way they navigate all aspects of their life. I'm a big believer of going and having lunch with a prospective, you know, investor, client, anybody, in part because I just want to see how they behave in a public forum. How do they treat the people at the front desk of a hotel or in a restaurant? How do they treat the, uh, the people they order from? Are they gracious or is it their forum to show that they're boss? And typically, if you see a chink in that armor at that level, it's been my experience, you'll see the same thing later on in some kind of a business circumstance. So integrity manifests itself in a lot of different ways, and you start to see patterns. And when you hang with good people, and it's not there with somebody you meet, you identify it quickly. Don, do you think people might be likely to do business with somebody, even if their price is higher, if the potential customer thinks they have integrity? You know, I've got a, uh, a large client right now that I'm working with a big industrial company out of the Southeast. And uh, we, we started taking apart what are the, the themes? This is, you know, half a billion dollar company. What are the themes that play out amongst the 23 people in the top management group? And uh, a key theme, which we found interesting, is learning and relationship. These people are all about relationship. It's a, it's a closely held family owned business. And we were talking about how they work with their large clients. And they said, the clients know that we will be fair with them. And if we have something that comes up in the middle of a multi-million dollar project, we will pause, talk with them and, and, and work through that because they know our integrity and how much we prize their relationship. Well, they're, they're typically always higher than the other people, but that reliability and that integrity allow them to work and it works for both parties. So yes, in answer to your question. Don, tell us how you think about and would construct what you call solid questions. I believe that we have lost the art of really asking good questions. And we always kind of want to, uh, if, if Bob, if you're talking about something, I tend to listen wanting to say, okay, Bob talks about this. Now I can't wait. Okay, Bob, let me tell you about my same situation like that. And versus listening to what you have to say 
and listening to questions that are very authentic, good questions of curiosity, confirmation, clarification, and turning around and saying, Bob, help me out. And tell me, what do you mean by this? And then genuinely listening. Bob, you and I have a relationship that starts there that's very powerful. And you start telling me things typically that otherwise I wouldn't have heard. And I think that that ability to ask questions and truly listen is a lost art. I work on it all the time and, and I fall far short of what it should be, but we shouldn't just want to talk. We need to ask questions and then just listen. And it's amazing what people will tell you. And you get a good read on their integrity too, by the way. Okay, thank you for that. Sure. Don, you have a number two is your definition of leadership. Would you like to read that and explain that? Sure. I don't have to read it because I've got that memorized. Okay. And I couldn't, it's unknown. I don't know who, I, somebody shared it with me five, six years ago and I just committed it, but it's leadership is inspiring the incremental discretionary effort that distinguishes commitment from compliance. So let me say it one more time. Leadership is inspiring the discretionary effort that distinguishes commitment from compliance. And Bob, what that means, if, if I work for you, I work alongside you, and I'm impressed at who Bob Patello is. I like the way his vision, I like his work ethic, I like the way he manages things. You have inspired in me something that wants to go the extra mile because I want to be at your side. That's leadership. I'm committed instead of just going, you know, it's 10 till five and I can't wait to get out of here. That's the difference between inspiring commitment and compliance and certain people do it really well. That's what leadership is in my definition. And I can't take credit. I don't know who wrote it. I just remembered it and I pass it on. Okay. Don, you and I have talked about in the past how sometimes being in business is like playing on a sports team, that you have to have other people on your team. You mentioned to me one time that it's good to have a relationship with an attorney, a banker, and a CPA. Can you tell me a little bit about what you look for in those kinds of relationships? Well, first of all, I think a lot of owner operators, uh, my, my father, Al Van Winkle, was a perfect example. Uh, you know, dad was smart. He worked hard, but he was a little intimidated by attorneys, by accountants, and by bankers. He didn't understand their language. He, he wasn't college educated. He was a very bright entrepreneur, but he didn't have a whole lot of use for the professional people. And uh, through my career development, I always paid attention to how he reacted. And I started looking out and well, if you find a, a really good accountant who's looking out for you all the time, isn't just caught in the numbers, they're actually sharing with you actionable, uh, you know, items that you can, insights that you can move on tax wise, they're thinking of the whole picture or a good attorney who isn't just working by the minute, by the hour and billing you, they're really thinking strategically. And I like to see it when you got professional people that are your advocates in the market. If I'm an attorney, I want people to know some of my clients and I wanna promote them in the market. The same with an accountant. And because of the banking background, I think it's very critical for bankers to be advocates of their clients, of their customers. And, if, if, if you're professional people, we're too busy. Life's precious, time's precious. If I don't have professional people who are for me, out looking for my best interest, still objective, but providing actionable insights and introductions, I don't have the right people. I look for professionals who are going to do that. Don, do you think that a business owner has the right and that it's okay to admit to themselves and maybe some of the people they work with that they don't know everything? Well, I, I mean, I think that's a, uh, a, a one of the most rare and attractive uh, traits a really good leader has is their, the, the, the vulnerability to say, I don't know, what do you guys think? And listen, 
uh, the, the, the days of bluffing, uh, I've sat in a, a table with uh, colleagues and I had messed up on something. And I came in and I sat down, all eyes were on me. And fortunately I had been schooled in this. And I said, I want you to know that I was wrong on that front. I think we're okay. I appreciate your patience. Let's move forward. And Bob, there was a collective sigh of relief because everybody was anticipating that I was not going to admit that I was wrong. And all of a sudden it opened up the doors for all of everybody else to take risk. And if they made a mistake to admit it, not hide behind it. It's amazing how much, what a slippery slope it is when you've got an organization that will it not, people aren't free to admit when they made a mistake. If you admit it, if you have it, admit it quickly and emphatically with something Al always said. And I, yeah, I think it's, we're, we're all, none of us are perfect. And I think that's an illusion out there. And I think it really undermines risk taking in healthy organizations. Thank you, Don. I want to let everybody know that if you have a question for Don between now and the end of the program, you can text it to me at 430-0548, or you can ask the question on the chat part of the Zoom. Don, tell me a little bit about profit formula. Yeah, this was uh, something during the banking days, and then I, I, it also happened in the investment banking days. But you know, well, no, it really started, I guess, for me when I really came home is I was when I was the CEO of what is now Lowe's uh, Supermarket. Uh, we had six grocery stores out there, and uh, in the grocery business, you work on what's called a very thin gross margin, twenty-five percent. And uh, your operating overhead, that's 25% of top line revenues is your gross profit. And then after that gross profit, you've got to take out all your overhead and all your overhead in the grocery store business is about 24%. So that leaves 1% being your operating profit. So it was a, a 25, 24, one. And that's a capital intensive business, very competitive. If you don't get your gross margin or don't manage your overhead right, you're upside down quickly. Compare that with uh, most manufacturing companies. We'll have a 40%, 45, 50% gross margin and get down and maybe have, let's say they got a 40, uh, you know, uh, a 30% overhead and a 10% or 15% operating profit. That's how they build projections and it gives them goals to work towards. And you can compare yourself with peers in your industry sector and see how you're doing and getting your gross margin or managing your overhead and that results in your operating profit. But let me back up just for a second. You talk about, you know, every dollar that comes in the door for a manufacturing, 60% of it goes for the manufacturing cost. 40% is left over. You take 30% of that just to pay your overhead. That's where you get your 10%. Every business sector has some type of a profit formula like that. And I always encourage owner operators to figure out, talk to other people in their industry and say, what should our bottom line be as a percentage of the top line? Is it 10%? Is it 12%? When I was in the uh, sportswear uh, design distribution firm, we would sell, we would uh, design product. We would have it third party manufactured. We would sell it and made a 50% gross margin. 10% went to the rep. 20% went to overhead and 20% was our operating profit. And uh, it was fun. We grew that from three and a half to 35 million over three years because we paid attention to that. We wanted that 15, 20% operating profit. So I don't care what the industry is, you, you've got a profit formula you could work on. Just think about gross profit margin, overhead percentage is the top of revenues and your operating profit. Make sense, Bob? Yes. So Don, let's talk about financials. Do you think it's okay just to look at them once a year or so, or do you need to do it more often? Well, I'm a believer in uh, looking at cash flow on a weekly basis. And uh, because I came up through the financial analysis world, and that's how I had, those are the engineering drawings that I would put financings together around, as well as understanding the people and getting a read on their integrity. Typically, integrity is high. They've got good financials. And uh, 
I remember the very first time I ever, I, I was a, a credit analyst and I did got on the loan platform at the First National Bank of Denver, which was one of the big, big banks in Denver. And I had my first uh, million dollar credit that came in and I presented it in these hallowed halls of you know the First National Bank of Denver. And there was a guy uh, who was the chairman and he heard me out, took off his glasses and said, Don, do the numbers talk to them? And I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, what do you mean? And so I said, Don, do they manage by the numbers or are they the kind of people that just put numbers together, make it look for good for the bank or they just do it annually? And these people were really honored. I said, no, these people operate, they pay attention to their numbers monthly and course correct off of their numbers and reproject. They know their profit formulas. And uh, I've never forgot that. I always ask, do the numbers talk to them? Meaning, do they actively manage and make decisions off of their numbers? Or are they always just looking at it on an annual basis? They don't know whether they made money at all or not for the year. So I'm a real advocate. And I spend a lot of time making sure that people understand how to use those numbers on a monthly basis. And I'm down to certain situations. When I was running Van Winkle's IGA, we had cash flow by the week. I knew how much cash came in through retail sales, what we paid out for products, what we paid out for all of our overhead and what our ending cash was. That became our beginning cash the next week. And we had to do it that way. Otherwise, we weren't running profitably, efficiently. So yes, you got to do it monthly. And they got to be reliable. Thank you for that, Don. I want to ask you something that's a little bit of a technical question. I don't know how deep you'll want to get into this, but I still have a hard time understanding what I'm about to ask you, even though I've been in business for a while. Can you have a profit but have no cash or vice versa? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, you can, uh, you know, you, you can generate a profit on paper and not manage your inventory properly or your receivables properly. And you've got all of your cash has been absorbed in a big buildup of inventory that's more than you need because let's face it, it's fun to buy inventory. But if you don't watch it, it absorbs all your cash or you're not managing your receivables properly. You're selling the product out there, taking back your know, receivables, but you're not collecting your receivables, so you don't have any cash in the bank. So certainly, I mean, those are two drivers right there that can totally absorb all of your cash, even though you're showing a good bottom line. You can also over leverage your company and you're making a profit on an income statement basis but your balance sheet has debt that you're having to service. So all your excess cash is going to service that debt, repay the principal plus the interest, and you don't have any cash. So that's why monitoring and planning is so key in managing, because to your point, you can generate a profit on paper and not have any cash. Don, I know people that look at only their profit and loss statements. They don't look at their cash flow statements. So are you tell me that could be a recipe for disaster if you don't look at both? Oh, you gotta look at both. And I, and I am a, a real believer in uh, analyzing your balance sheet. You know, I was talking about how you can have a, a build up in inventory or your receivables, which are both balance sheet items. And if you're not watching key metrics, like the, you know, your aging on your receivables or, you know, what kind of, how many, you know, you, you've got your uh, days, uh, forget what the term it is. It's a way to measure how much inventory based upon your monthly sales. Those are metrics that you can use to kind of track early on off of your balance sheet in coordination with analyzing your income statement and to your point, the cash flow also. And uh, if I've got a troubled situation out there or I'm not confident in the financials, I'll talk people into using a weekly cash flow and have them actually pull down the statements from the bank on a weekly, uh, on a weekly basis and track every cash in that went into the checking account and every cash out and classify it. And so they understand the flow of their cash flow. A lot of people get divorced from that. So yes, it's all three, Bob. Don, you shared with me a, a couple of words called customer 
profitability. Tell right. me a little bit about that. Yeah, you work with a lot of companies that have got a, you know, they're the manufacturing company. They do some great products. They're selling to various people. And all of a sudden you have a Home Depot that knocks on the door or a Walmart and they get, you know, stars in their eyes. Oh my gosh, we're going to be able to sell our product all over the United States through these great big behemoth, uh, you know, retailers. And when it's all said and done, oftentimes they compromise their margins. They sold at a cheaper price than they should have. Uh, some of those companies, this is vastly improved. And I've got experience recently with Walmart where they're paying very currently on their receivables with clients that I have. But a lot of these big companies would hold off paying the receivables. And also you've, you've, you've sold it at a cheaper price. So you're not making your gross margin. And all of a sudden, when you look at it, that customer relationship is break even at best. And in fact, you may be losing money. Uh, one of the, you know, uh, CVH or CHV, one of the big drug uh, retailers back in uh, the early 2000s was doing something called, they would uh, buy product from companies and they would buy a bunch of it, but it was called pay on scan, meaning they wouldn't pay you as the manufacturer until it actually scanned through their stores. So you were fronting them free inventory. And that all sign, sounds well and good, but it doesn't work. And the CVS, that's who it was, CVS. I think they've since changed. But CVS would come, they had three different uh, uh, product, SKU products in their vast network. And they said, this one is not turning well enough. We're going to put it in a warehouse and charge you for it. And even though you're scanning products here, we're not going to pay you until you get this out of our warehouse and pay us for the storage charges. And I went, wow, that's not good. My point is, analyze your customers. There may be a small customer who's just such a difficult player to work with, always leaning on you, doesn't pay you on time. In the grand scheme of things, it may not be a very good customer. So customer profitability is a key thing you need to look at. Thank you, Don. How do you posture your business to be attractive to capital? That's a, it's, there's a whole lot of pieces. That's, that's kind of the foundation of, you know, uh, fix the gutter now. Uh, I talk about, uh, first of all, have clean books and records. Have your contracts up to date. Have your tax returns tight and reliable and reconciled with your financial statements. And have some projections in place that show how you're going to get from where you are now to where you want to be to optimize value. If you're operating as a financial player, financial manager, you don't have to be a, a degree in accounting or finance. There's just basics uh, that prepares you well. Uh, another one would be, uh, there's a tendency that all of us got into, and I, I count myself guilty with this, where we think it's really cool to run as many personal expenses through the business account because they're tax deductible. And that's kind of a slippery slope. Uh, first of all, in the sell side process, you want to add all those back into your cash flow to say, get a normalized cash flow, but it always gets discounted. You put yourself in harm's way with the IRS if, in fact, they come in and want to audit and you're running things that are really just personal through on the tax side. I see mature companies move beyond just making that a flagrant way they operate and thinking it's cool. It's really, there's a point where you need to mature beyond it. And I always call it quit filling your kid's gas tank. And the other thing it does is it doesn't, you, you don't want to give your other employees license to be less than honorable with some of those expenses out there. If they see you being cavalier, they'll be cavalier also. Uh, I think there's one. Uh, diversify and out, evaluate your, both your revenues and your suppliers. If all of your revenues are coming from 80% of your revenues are coming from two major customers, yeah. you lose one of those, you're kind of put in harm's way. So I think it really important to diversify your customer base, but also your suppliers. If you have a supplier that falters, uh, that could put you in harm's way. So it's good to go ahead and uh, diversify. 
uh, and I'll, Bob, we can talk through, there's 10 of these, but I'll, I'll stop at four for a while. I'm a big believer, and that's where I talk about comparing notes, is finding a three-person board, or what Napoleon Hill called the Mastermind Alliance. People you respect, that you can take the CEO hat off, and you can share in confidence your numbers, your challenges. They're doing the same with me. And you guys kind of challenge one another. You, uh, you say, I've got this issue. I, don't, I can't talk to my wife about it. I can't talk to my employees about it. It's an issue. And then listen, if you've got quality people, they'll provide you very good insights. And they're relying on you to do the same. I think that keeps us out of what I call intellectual incest. A lot of CEOs only listen to themselves. And that's all they hear. And pretty much that's, that's not healthy for us. We need divergent opinions from people that we really like, that we really respect, and they respect us, and they want candor no matter what. You, you really move the ball forward when you have that available to you. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable with it. And I really believe you need to find that. I understand, by the way, uh, in Alamogordo, there is a group of younger <laughs> business people, professionals in the community who've kind of put something like this together on an informal basis. And boy, am I an advocate of that. That's powerful for, for Alamogordo. Don, tell me about why a succession plan in a business is important. Most good owner operators, Al Van Winkle, my father to be included, are optimist and they really have never confronted their own mortality. And uh, it's hard to think that uh, I may not be here for an unforeseen reason or in the event that, you know, I'm just ready to retire. And if I haven't identified my replacement and actively groomed and, and, and developed that individual, my business is at risk for me my business is at risk for my banker. My business is at risk for my legacy, the people that I want to hand my business off to. And when you actively develop people, not only are you putting in place this notion of succession and you're growing people, uh, you have more loyal, engaged people because they know you are invested and their well-being and their success. You're getting more out of them. It takes less time, less money, and less stress out of the equation if you have someone who you know who could fill in for you if something happened. And oh, by the way, when you put succession plans in place and they're working, you get better multiples in the sales side process. People are just going to pay you more because they know you got the management talent and a culture of developing people internally. Don, tell me about the importance of investing in the well-being and success of the people that you work with or that work for you. Yeah, it's kind of an extension of the succession planning, but uh, you know, I see a lot of uh, owner operators who uh, will, will maybe treat people like they were treated back when they were first in the workforce. And uh, that is, hey, you're, uh, you're, you're just a cog in the machine. You work for me. Uh, you'll do what I say. And I found that they then attract people who work in that environment. And then I've got other owner operator CEOs who say, I'm going to go out and find people who I know are smarter than I am. People who've got skills. We can talk. They're candid. And I'm going to let them know that I'm going to actively invest in their professional well-being and in their personal well-being. I want them to be successful. And it's not going to be on the fly coaching. It's going to be a program where I have 30 areas that I want to expose them to over the next year and get them conversant on that. And I'll share with them everything that I know, and I'll ask them to give me their ideas. Well, you can say, you know, here just by the tenor of the way I'm speaking there, Bob, that that tends to make some fertile ground for the right people. Some people you can invest in like that, and it's, uh, what is it, the old saying, it's throwing, it's pearls before swine. They don't get it. You have to find the right people. 
But if you can do that intentionally with the right people, it pays rich dividends in current period profitability in your succession plan and mitigating the, getting the risk for uh, your banks and their other financing sources and creating transferable value over time. Very necessary. And by the way, I think the millennial generation almost demands it. They've got to have a role, they got to have a purpose and a, and a calling as to why they want to work for you. Okay, thank you, Don. You told me one time that if you're going to make a decision in your business that you need to put it through a triangle filter. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, that was uh, that's something that I, uh, I took out of an investment banking book for middle market companies it was 10 or 12 years ago. And we used it and it was, uh, we call it a CEO decision filter. And if you, you just think about these, this triangle here and each point is just as key. There's no priority of points, but if on every major decision you would think about, ask yourself, what is the impact on my access to capital? Is my access to capital going to be more or less after through this decision? The other point is what's the impact on my succession plan? Is it going to get in the way of the people that I'm developing or what I eventually want to do out here with, uh, you know, being sold to this company out, you know, two years from now? Just what's the impact on my succession plan? And then finally, the third question is, what's the impact on my overall company value? And if you can answer those three questions, at least ponder those before you make that major decision, we find you're way ahead in the process. Uh, a, a real quick example would be, I've seen uh, businesses where they wanna buy their building uh, that they're in. They're tired of paying rent, okay? And they end up going out and buying their building and they put the debt on that building on their business financial statement. And all of a sudden they got more debt on that balance sheet than really they should have for a company that looks like their company. And it kind of inhibits their ability to get access to capital. Uh, they can also do it by doing it through a separate entity and then leasing it back to, uh, or leasing it to the, the company. But still, it's got a cash flow demand on it. Sometimes it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Other times, I've had situations where it really grounded a company for a season because they bought off more than they could chew, and it just over leveraged their entire company. So. Just it's a CEO decision filter. We we ended up reducing it down to notepads and had that uh, triangle, and had those questions that we got a lot of uh, a lot of applause for. John, I know that you've been on a lot of boards. Do you think it's good to have all the board members thinking the same way? Well, no, not at all. I, you know, I think that uh, uh, diversity of thinking and. Uh, you, you realize how people have experiences, they have wiring, they just have constitutions that are far different than yours. And oftentimes we wanna be around people who think and look at the world the way we do. And that's not healthy. You need to have a, a, a dynamic where you have people who've been through different experiences, have a different way that we all have a portal on how we see the world. Mine is often from a financial perspective and a building of value perspective. Uh, other people know that they've created great companies because they are such artful salespeople. They just know how to make the sales machine work. Uh, other people are just tenacious shoulder to the wheel people. They just know it's hard work. And all of us are right. But we have that human tendency to think that we're better than the other people. And if you can kind of pull that off and say, guys, we all see the world differently. How can we play off one another and make a smart decision that pulls on all of our perspectives versus everybody thinking alike? So I'm a, I, I have a real issue when you get what I call bobblehead directors who don't have independent thoughts and agree to everything. I think there's challenges that need to occur. We call it a healthy challenge. Healthy tension sometimes is good in an organization, especially at a board level. 
Don, I know that you've been around a lot of different types of people in your career, some successful, some not successful. I want to talk to you about both. So this is a two-part question. Tell me some of the common characteristics you see in people that have been a disappointment or a failure in life. Yeah, I think that uh, people who are kind of one trick ponies, they have uh, one skill set that they rely on in everything. I found typically don't have a legacy. Uh, if, if I'm a, uh, an engineer and all I want to do is engineer all the time and I create a company, by the way, there's a great adage out there about uh, uh, engineers make terrible CEOs, uh, even though they're smart, they're problem solvers, they're uh, tenacious, they're hardworking, it, but they make terrible CEOs until they figure out how to deal with ambiguity because the world is not a push button formula world. And in answer to your question, I think those owner operators who don't diversify their skill set and learn other things end up being short lived shows. I want to see them develop, you know, some, you know, financial skills, some sales skills, some marketing, some people management, some leadership skills, some tenacity those people are willing to adapt to what the situation calls for uh, are typically pretty successful. The people who don't want to adapt or change, I think they flounder a little bit. Don, would you consider your life a success? Uh, and why or why not? I, I'm successful, I believe, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm still curious. Uh, the people I love, love me. Uh, I get to work for myself. I get to pick and choose who I want to work for. And uh, I don't work for difficult people. I get people either get who I am and how we can work collaboratively. And it's the old two plus two equals four scenarios, or we just quietly walk away and nothing ever comes of it. And uh, because I work for myself, I have that forum and uh I don't think my last uh, hurrah is uh, over yet. I, I still think uh, I'm, I'm excited about new discoveries, uh, new opportunities. What I do, people pay me for, and they like it. And that's very gratifying, Bob. So in answer to your question, yes, I do feel like my life has been successful. At your stage in life, Don, would you rather have more time or more money? Well, that's uh, my wife and I are talking about that right now. And she said, you can't retire, Don. She goes, you would go crazy. You have to be in the game. You have to be creating something, interfacing, making something better. She goes, can you imagine what you would be like if every morning you got up and all you had to do was go out and play uh, men's golf with all the, the old dogs? She goes, you're not wired that way. She goes, we get to spend enough time to go do what we want to do. We've got a nice lifestyle, but I can't see you stopping work. I just like you to be more intentional about it. And so I try and balance that all the time, Bob. It's a, it's a real interesting balance, but I am, I, I, it's social stimulation and intellectual stimulation that works for me. Don, what would you like your legacy to be after you're gone? What would you like people to think or say about you? I, I'm obviously, uh, you know, was he was a man of uh, of honor who believed and in, invested in other people. Uh, I think that uh, to have people say that I was a part of their success and and added to what they realize from their business, it would be something that I would like to be known for. Uh, I think innovation. I, I, I think with when you come up through the accounting uh, finance world uh, and you can still have your feet firmly grounded in the basics, but still have an innovative, creative side that can bring dimensions to thinking through problems. Uh, 
I'd like to be known for that. I am known for that. And uh, that would be something I would like to have a legacy. And I think that uh, an honorable, decent person who wanted other people to succeed in, I've invested in certain people that I'm very proud that I invested in them. Good husband, good father. Thank you. Don, we had a, I want to remind everybody, if you have a question, you can let me know on the chat portion of the Zoom, or you can text me at 4300548. Don, one of the questions that was just sent to me, it says, does Don coach small business people? I do. Uh, you know, I, I work with, uh, you know, relatively large companies and if the situation's right and there's chemistry between myself and the owner operator, uh, and I've got a few in Alamogordo who are wonderful. And if that chemistry's right and I'm being fed in the process, as well as you're benefiting, that works. So yes, I do. Okay. Don, I know that you're familiar with companies and making money, but once you make money, you have to do something with it. So I'd like to know a little bit about your personal philosophy on investing. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I have made, uh, you know, my money that I've made through the years has not been in the traditional stock market. Certain people have done, well, I say that in the late 90s when I was living down in Alamogordo, uh, uh, John Brown, uh, we, we got, uh, I think we got a $25,000 uh, portfolio of stocks that were in you know, high-end uh, technology stocks, Cisco, you know, Apple, people like that, folks like that. And that was a r roaring time in the late nineties. And I couldn't wait to get the Albuquerque journal and see that Cisco's had been, you know, had split and doubled again. So I made good money there, but really it's been in smart real estate investments, uh, smart business investments where I've taken an investment in a company in part trading out my skill set with a level of uh, actual capital investment. Uh, obviously, you know, being able to, prepare the Van Winkles IGA on behalf of my three younger sisters and myself and sell that, we were able to walk away with some level of capital. Uh, so well, the other thing is I try and keep my personal overhead today next to nothing. Right? We have a mortgage payment. We've got it paid way down. We've reinvested in our house and I'm trying to live on a nice life, but I don't want heavy monthly overhead. So for me, it's been real estate. And I know there's a lot of people who financial planners like to see it all go into the markets. And I've done well with that. Uh, but it's, it's been more asset protection and preservation than for real growth for me other than to that period of the late 90s. Don, I had somebody text a question to me and I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about. Maybe you will remember what you said, but it the question is, what does your wife mean when she's uh, when she told you to be more intentional? Well, uh, you know, you can get flattered by people saying, oh, Don, hey, we want you to work with us. And you, you see a need and you like the people and you really realize ultimately you, 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 you should have vetted a little more thoroughly. Uh, they're, you're not going to be it's not going to be fulfilling for me and I can't add the value that I need to. And also think about the time consumption of it, the cash that they can pay you, and how does that fit in with what you want to do on the personal side? So she, when she says intentional, she's saying, Don, think it through. Don't just be flattered because somebody said, hey, Don Van Winkle, we would like you to work with us. Don, what do you think is wrong with people living above their means? Because these days, that's very easy to do with loans, credit cards, things like that. Why is there a danger in that? Well, I think we can all get caught in the, uh, what is it? Somebody talks about the uh, shiny thing in the tree. Well, you're a raccoon. And every time you see a new shiny thing in the tree, you want to go buy it or go invest in it or go, you know, just go look at it. And once you get it, you realize it wasn't that big of a deal. We've all bought things <laughs> thinking it was going to make us happier or complete a part of who we are only to find that 
stuck in the garage and I kind of got bored with it. And now I'm looking for that new shiny thing. And that's just life on the, on the planet. You got to get to the point where you're not always chasing something new out there. You're, you're kind of going, should I, I need to be grateful with what I have. And do I really want that? Or is it really, am I wanting that new asset, that new car, that new house, that new boat, because something else is not quite working in my life. And that's a hard question. It's a very personal question. But I think this fascination with buying all the time and building up personal debt, it just puts chains around you. You lose your flexibility. Credit cards are too easy to come by. And we need to think through and go, what do I really, really, what makes me happy? Not what do I have? Don, we're getting close to the end here. I've got maybe one or two more questions. Sure. If I had just graduated high school, and I know these are some very uncertain times right now, what advice would you give me? I'm, I'm a journal guy, and I think to get your own little private journal and start writing thing, you know, dreams and what really, what makes you happy? What comes natural to you? Uh, I have a close relationship, Conversant, that is a company out of Colorado that I work with. I do a lot of international work even with. And they ask, what is your zone of intuition? Where do you, where, where can you do things that come natural to you that you realize don't come as natural to other people? Is it your people skills? Are you an artist? Are you an engineer? Do you have a good business head? And I would kind of start just logging those down and then I would go out and I would get as much experience as I could in, in just working. When I was running the grocery stores, I would have uh, sackers come to me and go, Don, I'm bored. And I said, you know, if, if you're bored here, you're seeing a diversity of people. You're seeing uh, very your, your products. You're seeing uh, all kinds of new things going on. You're seeing transactions. You're learning all the time. You need to pay attention. And I said, if you're bored here, you're going to be bored for the rest of your life. So just get in and investigate. Hold on just a second. Sorry, I have contractors here and they're a little loud out there. My dog was barking. Okay, well, Don, I really appreciate your time today. Do you have any final words of wisdom or tips before we wrap this up? Uh, I will tell you that having spent uh, the majority of my life in Alamogordo and now being back there after having been gone for 20 years is uh, it's a fine community. Uh, there's a lot going on and I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing out there with this next generation and for the chamber to be doing what it's doing around these, uh, these discussions and just the pro-business side and, and, and moving the community forward, I salute all of you. It's been fun to see it through the bank board perspective and with various clients that I have down there. And keep doing it. New Mexico is a cool state. Alamogordo is a very cool community. Okay, Don. Well, thank you again for your time and your words of wisdom. We hope to see you back in Alamogordo soon. And I wish everybody watching or listening to this today, uh, hope you have a great day and a great weekend coming up. So go enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. You bet.